<laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'd love for you to meet my friend Emmanuel. If you don't know him already, you should. I know many of yes. you know him. Yes, and many of you in our community know our beautiful and beloved Anita Murjani. So we're so grateful to be here with you. Anita, it's such an honor. I love you so much. I hope you can feel that. Oh, I can, and I love you so much. And before we came on air, um, I was just telling you how much I miss you because for those who don't know, Emmanuel used to live in LA, which is where I'm currently living, but he's moved to Santa Barbara, which is a couple of hours away. I mean, still in California along the beautiful coastline. And, uh, and we used to hang out together. And so I really miss that. The last video we did, we were together sitting in the same room, remember? <laughs> <laughs> right. It was so fun. And we were also talking about how so many of you have been saying that we look related. So the secret is we are, but in the sense that we are all one. <laughs> yes, we are. We're all family. <laughs> we're all family. And I'm sure that um, you, yeah, it, in some lifetime, we were either either brother and sister or yeah. mother and son or father, daughter, something. But yes. yes, and so many people, even when we were at the Celebrate Your Life, asked if we were related. Oh, and that's it's, so cool. And it's really cool because even uh, what I love is like, um, I was at Celebrate Your Life with Milena, my social media manager, and people asked me if she was my daughter. And there's another oh. beautiful girl by the name of Arielle who um, was assisting me at the event and she's part of Celebrate Your Life and mm -hmm. she was the speaker's assistant for me and people asked me if she was my daughter. And the thing is, we were having so much fun just <laughs> laughing, the three of us, Ariel, <laughs> Milena and me. We were laughing and shopping at the concession stands and, and, and people saw us and I think what I loved most is that energetically we must have been so bonded that they thought we were related that they don't even notice we're not even the same race mm. which shows how little race matters yes. yes and i have to say one of the things one of the many things that i so appreciate about you is how you just have so much fun you don't take life too seriously and it makes me so happy i remember last time we were laughing so hard um, and that was really authentic. You really bring that out of me and uh, bring that. I feel like it's like a dolphin energy. So um, thank you for just being joy. Thank you for embodying that energy and sharing that with everybody. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. I, I really enjoy. I love being with with people like you who are light. And I think it's so important for people to know not to take life seriously, because that really is the key. And and I used to take life a lot more seriously before I had my death experience. Mm -hmm. And literally death taught me that nothing is worth being stressed out and upset mm -hmm. about, nothing. Mm -hmm. Because every all of that stress, all of that fear, it takes a toll on your life and it's just not worth yes. it. Yes, and having gone through, you know, uh, the war in the Middle East, um, having experienced that and had a lot of um, friends and family had to go through that. It's funny, as a kid, I felt more like a grown up. And as I got older, and you start healing and you start evolving, I became the kid. I'm sure you felt the same way, just being that lighthearted, free spirit, because, you know, sometimes life can be a little bit challenging, but it's how you choose to receive and experience it that makes all the difference. And I know your community and my community are really working through coming back to that joy again. So thank you for embodying that. Oh, thank you. And uh, it's, you know, and it's people, it's, it's all the people I meet like you, who I feel are part of my tribe that makes it so easy for me. Yes. And, and we have a comment from Shanice Nietzsche Jones. It's, and the comment is, hey, Anita, hey, Emmanuel, hey, everyone fr uh, from Virginia, y'all look alike. See, see what I mean? <laughs> Everybody says we look alike. I think it's so cool. Yes. It's so cool. Yes. It's so cute. We do. I love that. We look like family. Um, yes. And you know and what it is? I think it's also the universal thing because you could look Mediterranean or I could look Indian. I mean, there's a lot of different, uh, we, we have exactly. a universal energy, you know. Thank you. And yes, we do. We absolutely do. And there was a comment from Tamara that said, I look younger every day. Thank you. Yes, you do. <laughs> I was actually thinking that, Anita. I don't know what you're drinking, but you look amazing. 
<laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, wow. Thank you. I'm touched and flattered. <laughs> I think because life has got a little easier as well over the last few months, we, we had to go through the whole process of renewing my visa. And okay. I went through a whole process of, because I'm writing a third book, and I went through a process of getting a new publisher. And so it's, uh, you know, and, and yay, my book has landed on Simon & Schuster. I'm so Perfect. thrilled. But um, it was it. There was a little bit of stress there for a few months because I didn't know if I was going to continue living in America or I had to move mm -hmm. somewhere else. So, mm -hmm. so. But you so know, it's, how do you deal with stress? Like, what do you do to like? What's one thing that you can offer our community uh, to help you move through stressful times? Because a lot of people look at us and they think, oh well, they've got it figured out. But what's something that you can offer our audience? Um, that can really give them a palpable tool. Okay, so if I am dealing with stress, literally stress is when you're not feeling optimum, when you're feeling weighed down. Um, I actually spoke last week about all the stresses is like a backpack on our back and we really have to visualize taking the backpack off. But what I do ask people to do is to be aware if you are feeling stressed so that you can take more time to recharge your batteries. When you're feeling stressed, it's important to take more care about things like getting enough sleep. That's really important to me. It's mm -hmm. important to um, also even eat foods that uh, increase your energy mm -hmm. and eat less of the foods that make you feel slow and sluggish. You know, try to cut down on sugar because that gives you mm -hmm. a sugar high and then you drop. Now, I'm right. not someone that talks a lot about about foods, you really need to. But I do say that when it comes to food, listen to your body. Yes, yes. Because when you are at optimum health, and when you're not stressed and you're happy and you're optimum health, your body can absolutely handle that slice of cheesecake, that chocolate, <laughs> that whatever, that dessert. It really can. But we're not always in that state. And so <laughs> food is fuel that can help us to nurture our body when we're feeling less than optimal. The mistake, and so one of the reasons, one of the things I just want to touch on real quick about food, the mistake I made before when I had cancer, even before I had cancer, the mistake I made was that I was fearful of food. And I used to eat the right things or the, I, the right things because I was fearful of eating the wrong things. And mm -hmm. I thought that if I ate the wrong things, I would get cancer and ah. I would eat the fruit and the berries and, and, and the kale in order to avoid cancer. Uh, so that's, that's not even really enjoying your food. Exactly. I did not enjoy my food. I ate food from a place of fear. So uh, it's not that I'm against healthy food, but it is that I am against eating healthy food out of a fear of illness. You see, wow. if you are eating kale and with every mouthful, you're thinking, oh, my God, I don't want to get cancer. I have mm. to eat this to avoid getting cancer. I'm eating wow. this out of fear. And you and you you are with every mouthful eating that fearful energy. Mm -hmm. You could be eating a piece of cheesecake and feeling, oh, my God, this is yummy, delicious and be <laughs> so in yourself that mm -hmm. you're doing more good than harm eating right. the cheesecake. Right. That's so true. It's funny. I've I've been I share that often as well. And one thing that I notice is people hold the fear. They don't allow themselves to feel it. They don't allow themselves to honor it. They actually hold it and try to, you know, almost like it's a on a loop system, just literally in the body, creating that activation in the body of, you know, the cells that are not supporting you. But if you can just allow yourself to feel feel into the fear for a moment rather than try to create the story that sort of supports that fear, then the fear dissolves. Then it's like, oh, well, I don't have anything to fear. Let me start eating things that really are life enhancing, that feel more expansive to me, that, that uh, make my heart sing rather than eating this strict diet that is making me miserable and fearful. Exactly. And you see, here's the thing you spoke about, you spoke about stress, how do we release mm -hmm. stress? One of the things that can be very stressful for people is food and diet that can actually contribute 
to stress. Mm. So this is why, and, and in my case, before I had cancer, it definitely contributed to stress. Mm. I actually believed that the food we ate and a whole lot of the food we ate, I actually believed that that um, sugar and, and uh, microwave foods and preservatives and like just about everything, salad dressings, mm -hmm. everything contributed to cancer. So mm -hmm. I was so stressful, so stressed out about the food. I used to buy organic and I would eat vegan and raw, but I wasn't enjoying the food. Mm -hmm. I hated it. I missed you know, the hot curry or the sugar. I missed it, but I was too scared to eat it. So that was my stress. I couldn't go out and socialize with people right. because I knew, because I believed that what everyone was eating was going to cause cancer. How interesting. It's almost like uh, imprisoning yourself. A little I bit. was imprisoning myself. And so this is why I say that even the food can cause you stress. And so this is why I don't like to add to people's stress by saying, oh, we should eat this. We right. should eat this to avoid cancer. Because yeah. I already, for me, it's right. like been there, done that. And done I that. realized that, nope, it's something much bigger mm -hmm. than that. It's not. And how freeing is that? Because yeah. now you can advise people to just trust their own body and their intuition. That's amazing. That's an amazing insight. And it helps to release the stress. Yeah, and it does. And the thing is, I also, I also want people to know that in actuality, um, their bodies are more resilient than they think it is. We are capable of more than we have been led to believe we are. Our bodies are capable of more healing than we have been led to believe that we are. Because there are a lot of things at play here and we buy into it. Um, and um, I'm looking at the comments, Jaina, thank you. And also the previous, you know, so thank you all. I just want to real quickly, before we get deeply into this, because this is such a good and heavy Deep, topic. Yeah. Um, I just want to say thank you all for your positive comments and real quick for my community, um, Emmanuel, so Emmanuel Dogger is a really good friend of mine. He's also an author and a speaker, brilliant author, brilliant, brilliant speaker, very loving person. Um, the book that I know is Easy Peasy Prosperity. Would you like to real quick just tell my community a little bit about yourself? And if you like, I can do the same yes, for yours. Yes, of course. Yes. Um, and many of my community knows you, but we'll do that again. But hello, my beautiful Anita friends, new friends. Um, so yeah, it's just um, I was able to through a series of, of uh, life experiences, just like many of you, was able to heal myself of many things. I used to have scoliosis. I used to have a lot of skin issues. I used to have, um, I used to be mute for many years because of the war. I had PTSD. So, and having seen and, and experienced such, um, uh, you know, turbulence early on in my life really drove me to actually want to try an alternative route. So I began the uh, energy work and I began uh, meditation, yoga, acupuncture, you know, a lot of different things and was able to then heal myself and then take that and help others heal themselves uh, because we always say people only heal themselves. Nobody can heal you except for yourself. Um, and so then here we are and we do it in areas of prosperity. We do it in areas of, of health, wellness, et cetera. And um, it's just been an amazing journey. And Anita, I would love for you. I know you have an extraordinary story. Many of my community knows it. Uh, but if you want to share a little bit about how you got here and all the amazing sharings and offerings you contribute to the world. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so in, for me, it, uh, Wayne Dyer discovered my story, but, but my backstory is that I had cancer and I was supposed to die. I had what was diagnosed as terminal cancer and I was at end stage. It was lymphoma and I actually went into a coma and my organs shut down and the doctors said I wasn't going to make it. They told my family that I wasn't even going to make it through the night. But while I was in the coma, I actually experienced a state of clarity. Um, I, I actually crossed over and I left my body, completely left my body. And I experienced a state where I understood why I had cancer. Mm -hmm. I understood how 
all the thoughts and decisions and emotions and everything that I had felt throughout my life contributed to that moment where I was lying there in that hospital bed dying. And <clears throat> I reached a point where I felt I had a choice as to whether to come back into this physical body or to continue in that realm. I wanted to stay in that realm because it was so beautiful. I was like um, in this state of peace and love, something I'd never experienced here in the physical before. So I wanted to stay there. But my deceased father was there guiding me. And, um, and the thing is that I used to have a very turbulent relationship with my dad when I was growing up. But here he was being my guide and being so loving and kind and unconditionally loving towards me. And he was telling me that I needed to go back. He wanted me to know that I had spent a lifetime of living in fear. But <laughs> now that I knew the truth of who I am and why I got cancer, I needed to go back and live my life fearlessly. And mm -hmm. so I, uh, he wanted me to know that if I didn't go back, I would be wasting all the gifts of everything mm -hmm. I learned. And that's when I realized that if I went back, my physical body would heal and not just heal, but it would heal very quickly. And sure enough, um, I came out of the coma. I made the decision to come back. I came out of the coma and within weeks, the doctors could find no trace of cancer in my body. Wow. And they couldn't believe it. They didn't know what to write in my medical records. I'm just grateful it happened in a hospital. So I have medical proof because mm -hmm. people can be a little bit skeptical. And so I have had the medical proof to show that it really did happen. Mm -hmm. um, and I have kind of made it my mission to share with people what it is that I believe contributed to me getting cancer. I'm not I don't say it as a blanket statement, but I do believe that if people know this, it will help them because mm -hmm. I know that if I knew this before, I would not have got cancer. Mm -hmm. And since sharing my story, I do get feedback from people saying that it's helped them a lot and it's helped them <laughs> through their illness, which is yeah. why I continue to share it. So that's And really, I mean, I know you wouldn't, I don't think you would say you are, but you are through your healing, you healed others. So you are a healer. And that's what we are doing here. You know, healing is not just sitting on top of a mountain, although that's amazing, right? We, yes. That's wonderful and meditating, but healing is going through life's challenges and overcoming them in, in sometimes miraculous ways and being able to be the example and help others understand that they can experience something like that or greater, you know? Exactly. And you brought up a good point about um, about being in um, on a mountaintop. And oh, there's a comment from Christy Burge saying eloquent people with fabulous shirts. We got fabulous shirts. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> and so, you know, um, when people um, choose to leave the um, let's say the urban arena and go and become hermits and live in a mountaintop. That's very valuable in that they embody an energy and they want to preserve that energy. And they know that when they come into living every this everyday life, it can be very depleting, which it is. You know, we face so many, um, so many challenges in life, everything from, um, trying to stay healthy, trying to make money, trying, trying to deal with television and social media and politics and all this. So people, very often, people who are spiritual, who are sensitive, who are empaths, they need to remove themselves from this. And I don't blame them for spending a lifetime as a hermit or living on a mountaintop. And even by doing that, they're doing a service because mm -hmm. they are holding their energy and we are all connected and so they're mm -hmm. holding their energy at a level which helps to uplift to the raise planet the, right yeah to mm -hmm. raise the vibration of the planet but mm -hmm. then there are certain people like us like you and me and many others like i believe wayne dyer and many others who i believe that we were meant to be part of uh we were meant to integrate ourselves into life you know yes. and we are meant to speak and write and talk to people and articulate to help people 
who are out there in the workforce, who are raising families, who are living mm -hmm. in the world as whatever it is, as doctors, farmers, business people, where we are meant to be immersed in this world. And for those of us who are immersed in this um, urbanized world of living in this modern world filled with technology for us for people like you and me and many other spiritual teachers and healers out there who are also empathic and that's why they do the work they do this world is fraught with challenges wouldn't you mm -hmm. say Emmanuel absolutely and one of the things that has really helped me and you and I have spoken about this before is being able to hold that space just like those monks or whoever is on the mountaintop in real time in world time stepping into uh the world and being able to see the true essence of people i think this is uh compassion to its greatest you know some of the greatest teachers that and and masters that came before us really exemplified this like buddha Kuan Yin, jesus all those beings and what um they were able to do was yes seeing the story seeing what's happening but not feeling sorry for because what that does that lowers our energy as empaths we start feeling like a sponge taking on energy you know yes. it doesn't feel good and we're not really serving anybody by doing that but if we maintain that pristine awareness that even though someone is struggling, they come to you. I'm sure you hear a lot of people telling you, you know, what they're going through. You see the pure patterns of perfection within them, that source energy, the, the goddess, God energy within them, whatever you want to call it, uh, the I am presence, and just maintaining that ability and awareness to see them for who they really are. And we can talk about this all day and try to say to do it for others, but it really starts with ourself. Exactly. So, that if we can, you know, make it an imperative practice, just the way that we eat every day or drink water or breathe, if we just are mindful with us seeing ourselves for who we really are, that we are that sacred source energy itself expanding into more of itself here. And that sounds like what happened in your uh, crossover on not not so many um, word wording levels, uh, but what happens is when we see that for ourselves, then it becomes so much easier to see that for others and we elevate the consciousness of the planet rather than contribute to the story of the separation or the fear or the struggle that's going on would you say oh gosh you you are absolutely on point and what you just said is so important because most people when they learn um when they read the let's let's say when they read the spiritual books and all so first of all every single person is spiritual the only difference is not everyone realizes they are mm -hmm. but actually every single person on this planet is spiritual uh, whether you realize it or not you are spiritual i used to think that i had to work harder at being more spiritual and i thought that in order to be more spiritual i had to see the perfection in other people mm. and I had to forgive other people. I had to understand them and be compassionate towards them and see God in them. Mm. I neglected seeing it in myself. Mm. And you know what happens when we neglect seeing it in ourselves, we become depleted and empty and we continue to give everyone else the benefit of the doubt. We continue to allow to try and love everyone else unconditionally and turn the other cheek and allow them to be who they are we end up becoming doormats that's <laughs> yes yes that's what happened that's what happened to me um and it really took death for me to realize that mm. oh my gosh i am an expression of god too everyone mm -hmm. else is but mm -hmm. so am i it's yes. about seeing god within yourself and when you see god within yourself and you know, it's like Emmanuel, when you walk into a room, you light up the room. You oh, are healing you. people. And this is the truth. This is what I see you do. You thank are you. healing people before you said a word because yeah. you are an embodiment of God. And this is the idea is that when, when we realize that we are an embodiment of God, we're not sacrificing ourselves while elevating other people. 
-hmm. It's about realizing that you are God and you mm -hmm. are, and then you don't really have to worry about the spiritual teachings. You don't have mm -hmm. to worry about how do I be more spiritual? How do I be right. more compassionate? No, you just be who you are because you realize mm. that you are a spiritual being that is a mm. facet of God. And mm. also what it means um, is that when, when you are being abused, and so this was the mistake I used to make. I used to think that the most unconditional the most unconditionally loving thing I could do was to love the abuser unconditionally. But to me, that meant allowing him to continue to abuse me uh. and to keep loving him and to believe that at some point I will love him so much that he will stop mm -hmm. abusing me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's about seeing that, yes, he is a facet of God and so am I. Yes. Why would God allow themselves to be abused? Mm -hmm. I love myself enough to remove myself from the situation, but mm. at the same time, I can continue to see God in that person. I can continue mm. to love that person, but I can also continue to keep myself safe. Mm. I can even continue to help other people who are being abused by that person. But the mm. most loving thing I can do, the most service-oriented thing I can do is to not enable that facet of God to manifest as abuse. Mm, that's so powerful. I just want everyone to receive that right now. Just breathe that in and ask yourself where in your life there could be some room for you to really give more to yourself, be more loving, more compassionate for yourself because I know, you know, life happens where maybe we have children or we have parents that we have to take care of or we have a job where we have to manage people and it can get really exhausting and easy to fall into that trap of always outputting your energy. But who's giving it to you? And, you know, if you're struggling right now, if you're experiencing any hardships, it could just very well be what Anita said, that there's room for you to love yourself more and just give more to yourself from that space of honoring yourself. We're not talking from an egoic place, but from a reverend place, from a from a holy, sacred place. You are that. You you know, wherever you walk, you leave that trail of, of light. And when you acknowledge that, then you can be that more, right? Yes, a hundred percent. And the more that you acknowledge that the more that you actually appreciate and love other people. You, it goes, you know, like even if somebody has hurt you and you love yourself enough to remove yourself from the situation, you then don't feel the need to judge that person. And there's no need to, um, you know, to even forgive that person because you see the God in them, but you're not allowing yourself to be abused by them because you see the God in yourself as well, or you see mm -hmm. the love or the spirit in yourself as well. And mm -hmm. um, wow, we have a beautiful comment from <laughs> Ute. Uh, I tried to love an abusive man. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I thought at the time that I was being spiritual. What a misconception. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I was exactly there. I was exactly mm -hmm. there. That was the mm -hmm. arranged marriage that I ran away from. I mm -hmm. thought I was being unconditionally loving by even going through with it in the mm -hmm. first place. Mm -hmm. But it really took the last straw for me to run away. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it, a lot of people do that. M probably more women than men do that. But it's, yes. a, it's um, you know, scarily common how mm -hmm. we think that the most loving thing we can do is to allow ourselves to be abused. Well, I'll tell you the thing that completely changed it for me because empaths, so women and empaths especially have that, you know, it's like, it's almost like that savior or the need to help or heal or fix. And it kind of puts yeah. us in a, in a bind. That's kind of like the old paradigm. Um, so what I found was, by doing that, I'm betraying myself. Is that worth it? Is it worth it for me to love an abuser in a way where I'm allowing myself to be abused over and over again, whether it's a father or whoever, and you love them, but you don't have to allow them to continue abusing you because if you do, that's us 
betraying ourselves, and that's not worth it to me. And when I had that aha moment, that oh my gosh, by me literally being a doormat or being a people pleaser or someone who puts everything on hold for myself to make sure everyone is okay, I think that was my greatest lesson. I was literally manifesting physical imbalances and diseases and sick all the time because of that, you know. And you literally died because of that, you know, and so. We are grateful for these lessons, but when we understand that it was all us not um, doing something for ourselves that we've been giving everybody else, so in this case, we've been betraying ourselves. Uh, once I had that realization, everything changed, and I began making my well-being as important as the, as the well-being of whoever I was supporting and loving and nurturing. And that's when my body healed, my skin cleared up, um, I, I healed my PTSD, I was able to speak again. I mean, there's three years I didn't even speak because I, wow. I didn't even, yeah. So there's a lot of stuff that happened and really those are kind of extreme just like your experience, but it could be as simple as, you know, if someone right now is having a hardship in their a uh, job with one of the colleagues and there's a lot of discord there try honoring yourself try letting go of needing to please them try to be more compassionate with yourself you'll start to create an energy that moves you out of that loop that you have with them or karma or whatever yeah. that can eventually heal your relationship with them or they lovingly move out of your experience and you there's no um hard feelings it's just it just is what it is and you move on and that's really what i've noticed a lot over the past few years and it's been fantastic i'm sure you've experienced the same yeah i think that's brilliant that's really brilliant because um it's it's really important i also tell people that um you bring yourself wherever you go so if you actually believe that it is selfish to love yourself and all you do is give and give and give of yourself to other people, you end up draining your own battery and you become a drained and tired and stressed person. And so, and, and it, when you are a drained and stressed and tired person with your batteries completely depleted, that's who you take wherever you go. Whereas if you actually make it a point to charge your batteries, if you make it a point to charge your batteries and be and make it a point to do things that make you feel uplifted, that is the person you're taking where, where, wherever you go. And because we're all connected, you walk into a room and people feel healed just by your energy uplifting them before yes. you've even said anything or done anything. And mm -hmm. that's actually what I meant that you do that wherever you go, Emmanuel. I always feel like smiling well, it takes and laughing. One to know one. It takes one to know one. <laughs> And, oh. Oh, thank you. And, and we have a question from a woman named Tawny Wheaton. She says, how did you heal your scoliosis, Emmanuel? Mm. Well, first and foremost, um, you know, I'm not negating Western medicine because it has its place. Um, but I just know for me, uh, and I was a kid, actually, I was 11 years old when we began uh, going to different doctors to see what the options were. Um, it didn't resonate with my mom and I for me to get a metal rod in my spine and feel as if I have arthritis um, in my back for the rest of my life. Um, and it was severe. I had about a 30 degree uh, curvature in my spine. Wow. And the way, yes. So the way that I was able to actually heal that was, first of all, having a super open minded mother who, um, you know, was already um, had a predisposition predisposition to things like yoga and meditation and things like that. So she gave me a book and it was Conversations with God, uh, the first one by Neil Donald Walsh. And um, that actually was the first beginning of my healing process because it really released a lot of the the fear-based programming that some you know, a lot of religions um, create. Um, and of course, there's a lot of beauty and traditional things in uh, religion, but a lot of the fear was not serving me. And as an empath, I was literally um, twisting and turning physically also because of the war and all that. But I think the fear itself was creating a lot of that uh, uh, turning in my body. So once that fear was gone, I started 
being more open. I started to get acupuncture. I started to stretch. I did yoga. I did kundalini yoga. Um, I meditated. I prayed. Um, I studied um, psychology. I studied parapsychology. Um, started started learning different um, how to um, use energy life force energy to actually direct it in specific areas of the body in your consciousness and your energy field to upgrade your your physical emotional mental well-being so as a result of all of that i was able to go from a 30 degree spine to a one and a half um and to me that's not even anything i wow. find that as you know what it is for me that one and a half i'm like i could heal it but at the same time it's a reminder for me to stay humble to stay grounded be grateful and just appreciate and remember where I came from. So um, that's that's sort of just a little inside joke that I keep with myself that I'm sharing with all of you now. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's sort of the journey. And as I started loving myself, having compassion for myself more, I was able to provide that for others naturally, just like Anita said, you know, sometimes you don't even have to say anything. You just hold the space, you anchor light, you see them for their perfection of who they are, and they have no other choice but to step into that. It could be in that moment, it could be a few years down the line, but if one person is seeing us and holding that space for us, it just can't be, but they, that person eventually steps into that greatness as well. Um, it's it's a law, law of the universe. So um, that's sort of the long-winded uh, version, but thank you for that question. <laughs> it's a great answer. And I would never, you know, I mean, you look, your spine looks so normal and straight. <laughs> it's like, I would never have guessed that you had a 30 thank degree you. curvature. Oh my God, that's amazing. The thank healing you, you did. Um, thank you. Yeah, so it's it's really interesting. And somebody else, Janet Strang, has has uh, written a comment. Understand this too. Weight as the heaviness from fear. Learning to let go. Weight too can be let go. Yes, in fact, just about everything can be let go. And uh, I want to say that um, we've talked about weight. We've talked about um, you know the curvature of the spine. We've talked about empaths. Now, um, I actually believe that empaths is something that hasn't been being an empath is something that hasn't been recognized until very recently people who are super sensitive i actually believe people who are super sensitive who are empaths are more prone to health issues more prone <laughs> to yes. um because they feel everything, everything around them and they feel it and they absorb it they absorb <laughs> it into their energy and their physical body and i <laughs> actually think that when medicine starts to actually, um, or when researchers, medical researchers, start to realize that energetically empaths absorb things, when they start to realize this and recognize this, we will have the cure, a much more like um, healing, a deeper healing of many of the illnesses that we currently mm -hmm. face, which yes. have yet to, which they have yet to find a cure. There mm -hmm. are many things which I do not believe that the cure lies in medicine. I believe mm -hmm. that a lot of the research is looking in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. um, I know probably what I'm saying might be a little provocative for some. Mm -hmm. I am mm -hmm. not trying to trash <laughs> medicine because they have done a lot of good in the world. If I was having a, a medical emergency, I would probably, I would definitely probably call an ambulance and but i am talking about things that are chronic and prolonged and uh, things that we experience that are recurring it's because of certain patterns that we have absorbed and and i truly believe that the healing in these things does not lie in medicine mm -hmm. um, and i think one thing to, to add to that is so the millennials feel that as well so the millennials are usually it's it's the next generation so between 18 and 35 so i'm grateful to be part of that and um it's you know we understand that nature heals we yeah. understand the natural um whether it's conscious or unconscious a lot of the millennials are here very conscious and awake and and uh they get it they get spirituality they may not sit on top of the mountain all the time but they they get it and a lot of times um uh, you know older generations see us as you know well we are 
um, hiding or we don't really, we, we um, protect ourselves and we don't really, we're always on um, video games and things like that. That's the, that's sort of like the, the collective uh, judgment. But there's a lot of us that are really um, thinking outside of the box and thinking of ways, like you said, to create um, healing uh, alternatives and technologies and tools that can really help people get to the root of what's yeah. going on rather than just the band-aid. So it is happening and I've seen it. I have a lot of uh, friends and colleagues who are really active and passionate about uh, nature and, and healing in that way um, naturally. So I'm very hopeful and very excited and hopefully that will create a nice bridge between the medical and you know the Eastern philosophies and the new millennial uh, insights that come together that create that really holistic approach. I like that, and I'm counting on you, millennials. <laughs> and and also, we're getting some positive responses for what we're now saying. Kira Gotowski has said, "Please keep putting these ideas out there. It would be amazing if researchers would start looking into this more." Because I'm counting on millennials like you because people of my generation and older they still um, worship the traditional medicine <laughs> and I actually think that the way that diseases are dealt with in typical conventional hospitals is so archaic it's so um, behind the times because when you really think about it um, if you really think about it so much of that hasn't changed. And when I say it hasn't changed, technology may have advanced, but the thinking behind the technology mm -hmm. has not yes. advanced. In other words, they will come up with earlier and earlier detection tools for cancer, mm -hmm. but which tells you that the thinking of what cancer is hasn't changed. And they think mm -hmm. that the um, that the solution lies in earlier and earlier detection, but where they haven't advanced is in their understanding of what cancer is. Mm -hmm. What if for certain people, and again, I'm not going to say this is the case for everyone, but I'll bet it's the case for a lot of people. What if for a lot of people, cancer is because of what they've absorbed as being mm -hmm. for, as a result of being an empath? Empath, yeah. They're not even looking in that direction. They're still looking at it from the physical. They're mm -hmm. not looking beyond the physical. But before mm. cancer even manifests as a physical, it's already been in you energetically for mm -hmm. a long, long time. Mm. So, right. yeah. Right. And, and like the tools that you're sharing and we're sharing today is some things to counter that is to start having more compassion for yourself, to love yourself. And, you know, we were talking about weight. Weight could also be armor protecting you yes. from feeling something that maybe you feel is too painful or it's, it makes you feel angry or whatever. So a lot of people suppress their feelings. So one of the keys, one technology that I've been really excited in, and we've been de developing it for many years now, testing it, kind of refining it. That's the next book coming out, The Core Work. Um, but so The Core Work shows us that most of the reason why people are struggling and they're not experiencing the healing or the expansion that they truly want is because they're not willing to feel something. They're hiding it. They're burying it. So when we bring it to the surface in a loving way, in a compassionate way that allows them to move through it, to embrace it, to honor it, then it will start to no longer have hold over them. It will drop and then they can now heal because the body, like you said, Anita, has the natural ability to heal itself. It has a divine intelligence. The mind is a powerful gift. A lot of people say, well, let's get rid of the ego and spiritual teachings, but the mind has a purpose. It has a place. It's here to be the observer. It's here to um, experience gift of sight, sound, taste, touch, smell. If we didn't have the mind, we wouldn't be here. So when we exactly. return it back to its purpose and enjoy this reality and being in that rather than being all about fear and survival, which is what it kind of realized or thought it is all about, um, that's when the healing starts happening. But it has to begin with allowing ourselves to feel 
all the things that we have been running away from or not fully acknowledging. Once we do that, the body will heal. Everything else will take care of itself. 100%. This is something that I think you know, I'm really passionate about, and we're going to start working with scientists and different, um, you know, left brainers to really bring more of that research in to show that that is what can happen when you physically start allowing yourself to move in that direction. I love that. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And oh, yeah. it sounds like your next book is going to be really exciting. <laughs> and, I'm passionate. <laughs> and I just want to quickly mention one of the comments was from a lady named Susan. And she said she, um, you know, beautifully said she said that um, uh, she's age 70 and she respectfully disagrees with one of the things we said, possibly what I said about it being uh, about giving the credit to the millennials and also the older people um, not thinking in the right way because she's 70. And so I want to say to Susan, thank you for being uh, yes, for, for the way you thing. think. I so appreciate it. I'd give you a cyber hug right now. Mm -hmm. And we were not meaning to diss the older people because remember, I was putting myself in that same category. And I was saying people from my generation, because um, at the time when it happened to me, I truly believed that people were more ready to dismiss what I was saying and to make me feel de um, delusional for believing what I believed after the experience I had. Mm -hmm. And so I was going by my own experience, but I am always so grateful to anyone who can see it outside of the box. So it was yes. not aimed at any particular generation. And I apologize. And I appreciate yes. um, people of any age who are able to welcome new paradigms and new ways mm -hmm. of looking at things. And one thing I want to add to that is, you know, so what was her name? What was her Susan. Name? Susan. I missed her last name. You know, amazing. We call them way showers. They he they held the light. They anchored it. They paved the way for so many of the things that are coming through right now. Whether it's in technology, whether it's us sitting Susan here and speaking. Yes. 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 So we honor and we are so grateful. And it's because of you, because of them, we are here. So that's always the approach. That's always how. Um, you know, that's how I always see it is that they opened the door for us and created this huge awakening and, and stirring in the consciousness so that we can wake up. And now we are all stepping into it. Exactly, exactly right. And what I'm noticing is that it's actually getting easier. People are more responsive. When I started talking about this 12 years ago, people were much less responsive. I would have said that there were more skeptics than believers of what mm -hmm. I was trying to say. Today, mm -hmm. I actually am noticing it's the other way around. That's I'm amazing. finding that, yeah. And, and so this is why um, I feel people are changing. People really are changing. And so it's, it's good. It's a very positive thing that's happening. Helene, yes. Helene Beth has said I, that she agrees with us and people have to be willing to think about disease differently. Most are not open because they're afraid to accept the truth. They want others to heal them rather than to look within. Yeah, it's hard work to look within. Repression is the key. Once they accept what is the cause within, they would begin healing. And that's so true. Thank you, Helene. In fact, you. Um, uh, just if, if for those who are interested next week, I'm actually going to talk about the fear of illness coming back. Many people who've, who've had illness before, who've had cancer before, their biggest fear is that it's going to come back. And that's something I will be addressing next week, next mm, Sunday. That's so, a good one. Yeah. And so, Emmanuel, you know, one of the things I wanted to actually ask you while we're speaking together is that um, um, your book, Easy Peasy Prosperity, the, I think what is really great about that is that it is targeted or aimed or written for people like us, people who are empaths, people who, out there who want to follow their hearts, who want to do the work, um, who want to, who want the freedom to do what they love and not mm -hmm. have to worry about money in the sense they don't want to go to a job that they hate to pay the bills. Um, and many empaths, healers, teachers, uh, they fall into this category where they struggle making money. So I would love for any little piece of wisdom or snippet mm -hmm. from you to help people who are on that path. 
Uh, thank you for that. And this is something in our culture right now. It's so prevalent, uh, especially with all that's going on. And uh, one thing that I would say, I mean, there's a lot of components and each person is different. So you'd have to see, you know, you go through and, and see what layers need to be uh, addressed. But one thing that I think really is a blanket for everyone is a lot of people tend to live in a world of or rather than in a world of and, meaning they feel like I have to pick this or that. And what that immediately does is it moves you into lack consciousness rather than abundant consciousness. So what if the question you can ask yourself, am I, or where have I been living or where have I been sort of making my decisions from a place of or? I have to get a massage or I have to, you know, take my friend out for lunch. So what if you can have all of it and at least be open to the idea that you can have all of it and then uh, set that tone? So it may not have to be in the same day, but maybe in the same month, you can hold the space, you can create the space. I'm going to take my friend out to lunch and I'm going to treat myself to a massage because that's just as important to take care of myself and nurture myself. So as you begin to integrate this idea of and, start seeing how you can incorporate and bring that more into the areas of or. You know, the mind will create stories. Well, I have to pay my bills or... The, so thank the mind. The mind is here just to protect you. It's trying to keep you safe the best way that it knows how. I see it as a little uh, baby or I see it as my little inner child. Um, and I, I just send it so much love and compassion because it has a certain awareness that was operating in survival that's just trying to protect you. So that alone, that awareness that your mind is just whatever chatter comes in is just trying to keep you safe and protected can you bring you back to a more peaceful and loving relationship with your mind. Once that's established, then you can ask yourself, okay, so where, can, where are little baby steps? excuse me, what are little baby steps that I can add this and? Okay, I'm going to um, uh, meditate today and I'm going to go walk in nature. How abundant is that? Like you've already expanded. You're not picking one or the other. So see how that feels with you. It's such a simple little tool that you can use, but it starts the process that will lead you to the next, to the next, so you can have a officially heal yourself from any lack that you've been experiencing oh i like that so it's an and 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 for some reason my mind started thinking wow you could eventually get to bigger things like um for example people think in terms of i can either i can either be an artist or mm. i would have to get a job you know, if I want yes. to make money, it's one or the other. It's like, but if I want to make more? money, I would have to get a job or I can be a starving artist. You know, people mm -hmm. tend to assume that certain professions don't, uh, don't make money, but that's actually not true. It can be, mm -hmm. I can be an artist and make a living. Mm -hmm. So how I'm powerful and imagine you're making a living at a job and that will help you invest more in your art and your music or whatever it is. And you literally end up becoming full time in your artwork. I mean, how amazing is that? So it really opens things up. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think that one is. So I, I love your simple formula, the simple way of doing it. And I, there's a comment from a lady by the name of Debbie who said she loves my dad's simple advice of uh, Debbie Jones Sablak. Anita, I love your father's simple advice to live fearlessly. Thank you. Um, that advice was like, I still remind myself of it every day because when he told me to live fearlessly, it wasn't about like suddenly go parachuting or bungee jumping <laughs> if that's not my thing. It was about being yourself fearlessly. How many of you are afraid to be yourself? And this is the thing I love about Emmanuel. He's always himself. And we have a comment from Joe Wong. I am loving this company conversation. Thank you both. Eman oh, Emmanuel, he's just saying that your microphone is a little glitchy, but that's cool. 
Yeah. But thank you, Joe. He's lo she's loving the um, conversation. Sorry, I didn't look at the picture. And I look at the picture and I see Joe. Sorry, it's a she. Um, so thank you for that comment. And uh, so I think everybody's really enjoying it. And I thought we'll just go for a couple of minutes more because yeah. they seem to want more. And what I wanted to mention was what was really hilarious was when you were still living in L.A., um, you and Mike and Danny and I, we were hanging out together and we went out for lunch one day. And I admitted something that I don't always admit is that <laughs> my little secret is that I suffer from what I call food FOMO, remember? Yeah, oh yeah. And you Can guys... you tell them what that is? Can you tell them what food FOMO is? Yeah, and you guys were like laughing and laughing and laughing at me. All three of you, Danny, you, Mike, all of you were picking on me. So most With love. of you... I know, and I loved it. It was so funny. And that's the thing. We laugh at nothing, and that's, that's what I love. It does, there doesn't have to be something funny. I mean, we look at your dog and we laugh, don't we? Right. I know. Oh, my gosh. And so uh, most of you probably know what FOMO is, F-O-M-O, -O, fear of missing out. So food FOMO is that I feel that everybody else's dish when we're ordering in a restaurant, I feel everybody else's dish is better than mine. <laughs> so I kind of have to look around and see what everybody's having. And, and those of you listening and watching, please admit it. I can't be the only one <laughs> who has this issue please admit it and help me out here if you suffer from the same thing <laughs> so can you tell them what we ended up doing so i admitted to them that i have food fomo and that um whenever we order food i like family style because every everybody orders one dish and it goes <laughs> into the middle and we all share then i don't have to envy what everybody else is eating <laughs> So then we were at this beautiful restaurant, which Emmanuel recommended, which was um, it was a vegetarian restaurant with great healthy food. And I and I looked down the menu and I said, oh, my God, they've got nachos, but it's like gluten free and dairy free and it's like really healthy. So um, so I looked around and I, I kind of assumed that they were sympathetic to my food FOMO and they were they had uh, Yes, my, my Michelle, it's food envy. Exactly. So very often I will look around at what other people in the restaurant are eating and I'll ask the server, the waiter, like, what's that? What's that? I can't just go and look at a menu and order. I just it just doesn't happen because otherwise when my food comes, everyone else's food will look better than mine. So um, so I thought we'd agreed to do family style because these guys were laughing at me about having food FOMO. And, and so they said, yeah, yeah, don't worry, we'll take care of it. So then um, when, the, when the waiter came, they told me, okay, you pick first. So I picked the nachos. And as the waiter went round, then went to Manuel, and Manuel goes, I'll have the nachos too. And then Mike goes, I'll have the nachos too. <laughs> and Danny goes, I'll have the nachos too. And there were four orders of nacho and they go we wanted See? to honor you <laughs> <laughs> we honored your food fomo you're not going to envy us oh my yeah. god <laughs> that was so funny <laughs> i know and i really didn't expect that and i was stuck with this whole plate of nachos <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I'd love to hear from you guys if you have food envy and food FOMO as well and whether yeah. you're someone that likes to have a taste of everything. Yeah. See, we have fun. Anita and all of us, we have fun and we are just normal, hilarious, silly beings. <laughs> oh, God, I know. And yeah, and I have to have a taste of everything. Otherwise, it's like, well, oh, I promise I'm next out. time. I promise next time I will get something different so you can try it and we can share. I promise. That's my Boy Scout honor. Oh, thank you. See, <laughs> that's made my day. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> oh, oh, my gosh. Ooh, that's... you hurt my cheeks. I know. I'm like crying thinking about all three of you guys plotting and all three of you ordered nachos because I did. <laughs> And you did it just so that you wouldn't have to share. <laughs> Maybe. 
<laughs> oh, no, yeah. we. No, it was. It's actually a delicious dish. It really is. So I that was that was a fun experience. Though I love how uh, you were like trying. You were looking, and you're like, "Wait, you all have the same thing." <laughs> <laughs> I know. We got to do that again sometime. And what was the name of that restaurant? We've been wanting to go back and we forgot what it was called. Yes, it's one of my favorites. It's Sun Cafe in Sun Studio Cafe. City, California. Okay, good. We got to make a note of that. They were they were really great. It was such a great restaurant. But yeah. Emmanuel, it is such a such a joy talking to you. We have had such beautiful comments. We can go back and read the comments and yes, um, yes and and someone else has just invited us to Daytona. They said it would be a joy to share <laughs> us there. And thank Yay. you. And yeah, it was such a joy. And mm -hmm. where can people, my community, find out more about you or find out more about your events if they want to attend or your books, yes. anything like that? Well, first of all, it's such an honor to be in your space. I adore you so much. You have such a, you know, uh, you're such a master. So thank you uh, for that. And thank you, Danny. I know you're behind uh, doing the tech stuff. We're so grateful for you for keeping all this uh, running smoothly. And I appreciate you so much. Uh, so your audience can check me out at Emmanuel dagger.com e double m a n u e l d a g h e r and um i you know all of my events are posted there and i also have a really loving uh community on facebook and instagram so if you feel inclined just my name put it in a search and you'll find it um and it's just it's we really have a, a good time and it's about community for me it's really about community and anita can you please share about your beautiful work and where we can find you. Thank you. Um, so my website is anitamorjani.com, A-N-I-T-A-M-O-O-R-J-A-N-I.com. And I have a beautiful community on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, and also on YouTube. All my videos are now on a YouTube channel. And I would love for people to just join in, participate. We just, what I try and do is just to make things lively and fun, but at the same time, real, like things that really help and apply in real life to help people not to judge themselves too harshly and help them live a life and um, yeah, and really to not just be successful, but to thrive, to really thrive. Mm, and that comes across, you know, we do it because we love it and it's so... It makes our heart sing and it really shows so much. I mean, that's why I feel you're a soul sister because I know we may not speak all the time, but I, I feel you and, and your uh, beautiful family. And I just know that uh, what you do is coming from your heart and that I think your audience feels that and my audience too. Oh, thank you. And I feel exactly the same way about you. Um, one of the reasons I love connecting with you is because I feel you're a soul brother. I connect really well with people who do this authentically from a place of love and from their heart. And I also just want to say this for both our audiences, is that sometimes people say to me that different teachers have different messages and sometimes the messages may appear to contradict each other. Mm -hmm. So what I want to say here is that as long as they're coming from a place of love, you can't go wrong. It doesn't. You listen to the message that resonates with you. But the main thing is they're coming from a place of love and you're applying it to yourself from a place of love and not from a place of fear. That's mm -hmm. all that matters. And then just by doing that, you choose the messages that resonate with you because actually they all lead to the same place. <laughs> but we all articulate it differently or we're articulating it from different angles. And sometimes when something is taken out of context, it sounds contradictory, but mm -hmm. we're coming at things from different angles and our backgrounds are different. Our experiences are different. So we're coming at things from different angles. So the only thing to look for is, is the person sharing the message coming from a place of love and are you receiving it from a place of love and not fear? Beautiful. That's yes. all. Yeah. Mm. So thank you again, Emmanuel. <laughs> hey, Joanna's just posted. Hi, Joanna May. And thank you so much for 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 agreeing to do this. I know it was my of idea. Course. And thank you. And I loved the fact 
that um, I had a chance to um, meet your your audience and that my audience had a chance to meet you. That's what yes. I'm really thrilled about because I know many of them know you already and I just felt the ones that don't, um, I would love for them to meet you. So yes, and I, and I envision us continuing to do events together out on the road from time to time. Uh, I know it would just be such perfect synergy. So when the time is right, it will show itself. Yes, it will. Thank you. I envision that too. So yes. Yeah, thank you. And All thank right. you, everybody, for tuning in. Love we you. We love lots. you. Love you lots. Bye. Mwah.